Hello, everybody. This is Ian McDonald with Stick Drummer Magazine. Uh, honored and humbled and happy to be bringing you this, uh, well, we'll call it a round table uh, to start with, but we'll see what happens. Uh, tonight, I am I am joined by uh, Mr. Raynan Bozio below me. Um, and uh, we have next to him Mr. Gus Rios and Jason Bittner. And then moving up, we have Mr. Matt Thompson. And then, of course, Mr. Derek Roddy in the, in the top middle, which probably didn't have to describe because you probably all know who they are regardless um thank you all for taking the time to join us tonight uh this is our first real round table with more than three people um so i'm pretty excited to see where this goes and again i'm honored to have every single one of you on here um should be pretty fun i've known you all for a long time um so let's just start it off right now if you don't mind with uh rain and go ahead and uh, give everybody a little bit of an intro about yourself, you know, maybe uh, about some of the music you grew up with in your household. And uh, obviously, aside from your dad, maybe <laughs> who else maybe uh, inspired you to pick up drumsticks and want to be a drummer? Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, this is actually one of my favorite things to talk about, believe it or not. Uh, the I I credit so much to my parents' diverse musical tastes and being in these long car rides with them. <laughs> at any time hearing what they were playing. So from my dad being the guy he is, he's listening to world music, you know, African drumming, Latin drumming, all this crazy stuff. Sometimes just Asian flute music. You know what I mean? We'd be, I'm sitting there like 10 years old, you know, okay, come on. When can we put the corn CD on? Um, but uh, yeah, man, it was uh, uh, Joe Zawinul, Miles Davis, you know, weather report, all this amazing uh, music, jazz, you know, um, fusion, experimental mm -hmm. stuff, you know, a uh, classical, always playing <coughs> classical in the car. So uh, I really grew over time to appreciate those uh, th those kinds of music and really appreciate the beauty of them and 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 uh, how just because it's not you know necessarily ordinary doesn't mean there's nothing to be found in it. You know what I mean? But then from my mom's side, got the rock, heavy metal, punk you know, all the classics, uh, you know, some of the uh, the 80s stuff, the 70s stuff. So I would hear Sex Pistols and the Ramones and freaking <laughs> Rob Halford fight. You know what I mean? All this, you know, awesome, incredible music from every kind of, you know, rock you could imagine. And she worked at Capitol Records for a long time, too. So she was uh, really instrumental in that uh, whole 80s and, and kind of early 90s metal uh, movement, you know, so. Nice. Yeah, man. And and, and yeah. it reflects in me. Respect. I discovered hip hop and, and Japanese music and video game <clears> music <throat> and all these other kind of things that I like. And um, I kind of just use that blend and, and that really lends to the ability to uh, play different styles of music and, and make yourself, you know, I mean, I can speak for Gus, Matt, I mean, all these guys, they, they don't just play one, one genre, even though you might know them from heavy metal these guys can play it all. They can do it all. And that's, that's part of being a great drummer. You know what I mean? Is being able to say there's no genre limit. There's no, you know, this is, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't going to be my one thing. I mean, to each their own, obviously some people are into that and that's cool too. But I feel like with, with many drummers, we, we like to play everything. We like to listen to everything. So being blessed and uh, obviously having Terry Bozio as a, as a father, um, <laughs> you know, you've got a lot of drum inspiration to look at whether you want to or not. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, man, it's been yeah. beautiful. And, and I can say, you know, uh, to call you guys, my friends, uh, my heroes, you know, I'm, I'm blessed a lot because my dad is the one who helped open the door and introduce me to you guys. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just a pleasure to be here and, uh, you know, to talk drums, to talk music. We love it all, baby. Nice. Yes. Cool. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Hey, uh, yeah. uh, Matt. Hey man, it's insane that I'm talking to Terry Bozio's kid, man. What? <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, you know, like, yeah, I, I guess I, there's not much I can say. That's but, how I feel talking to you Terry guys. Bozio the the feeling is 100% mutual man uh, you know like i said all of you guys are super influential to me since i was a teenager you know um and i'm i'm just I, i'm blessed to be here i'm i know ian feels the same and i know you guys all feel the same about each other cuz 
I think it's just the mutual yeah, totally. admiration society here. <laughs> what are you? What's that? How old are you now? Thirty-three. I'm a, I'm gonna be thirty-four here at the end of the year. So. Uh, All right. Yeah. Seventy. That late seventies Zappa dude. Like what the. F um. So all right. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. My, I love uh, it, bro. We, we, I think, I think we got, we got many uh, late '70s Zappa fans in the house right now. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's the best shit, man. Okay, so um, my, my, I grew up mostly with my mom. She was a um, classical violinist who ended up teaching uh, in my, um, in my school district in New Jersey. So she played a lot of classical stuff. <clears throat> and when I visited my dad, he uh, was a um, recording engineer for National Public Radio in DC. And he played um, all kinds of stuff, uh, a lot of jazz and a lot of um, funk. And uh, I got to hear a lot of like, um, if you remember, NPR used to have Jazz Alive. So I got to listen to that a lot. And um, and they were both very supportive of uh, the avenues I was exploring in music, which were numerous. That's awesome. Can you hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> oh yeah, no, oh, I, there you I go. think yeah. we're all we're all just we're we're vibing. You can't see our faces <laughs> as close. Yeah, as we hear you. Fine. Well, what's what's interesting is like this is I I I would I've known all of you pretty much for years and years and years and years. I hang out with Derek on the reg, and I still want to hear this story from him. Like it, this is this is even interesting, and we've known each other forever. Like. I'm totally interested in both you guys' stories. Everybody's, you know what I mean? So this is rad, man, you know, and we've known each other forever. Well, we should kick yeah. it over to you in that case, Gus, because, um, man, not only an amazing Fucking drummer, hell. but he can also play guitar. He can also sing. And bass. He's just a freaking, yeah, he's, a, he's an absolute beast. Uh, under uh, unknown the the musical talent <laughs> that this guy has you know what i mean it's it's so vast beyond what you could imagine from from what you might know him uh as on you know his recordings etc but yeah guys please take over um i mean my story is definitely considerably different in the sense that i, I grew up in a you know my parents <clears throat> and i was we i was born in venezuela but i moved to florida when I was only 10 months old. So, I mean, I'm basically a Floridian, but in my household, my parents were listening to straight up Latin music. Um, like that's it. And the only way I discovered metal was my brother's best friend at the time. Those two would stay up watching headbangers ball. This is like 19, this is like 86. And, um, I, and then I eventually just started watching him bang his ball with him and just started, you know, almost looking back now, it was just like the antithesis to everything going on in my house. So like, you know, the more I just immediately gravitated towards the, the more brutal, the better. I mean, the first time I heard rain and blood was early 87. So the record had been out a minute and my brother and this kid, Sean and I, we bought this cassette, which I still have. And I just remember pressing play on, on, on that album. And I honestly, I can remember it. And that was a moment for me that I was like, I had never connected with music on that level. And it just did something inside me. And I went, that's what I'm doing. And I started on guitar first, actually. Um, and then it was a thing where my brother and I kind of got good enough on guitar that we could like write our own riffs. And it turned into a thing where like, well, who the hell's gonna play drums? So I started playing this dude, Chris, from school's drum set. And I just ended up getting, you know, better than anybody else in our little metal head group. So I was just the designated drummer because I could go buckle, 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 buckle. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it, it just stuck. I, so uh, I was like born a necessity. I could totally actually relate to that because it's like, all right, I wanted to play guitar and sing. But they're like, Raiden, 
you got the fucking kit. You're the only one who, who has a kit in their garage they can play. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nobody else it it. would let them have a drum kit. So I'm like, all right, well. Because, <laughs> dude, like, every guitar player plays drums, right? Like, every guitar player goes and sits behind your drum set, and you're like. They wish, you know. They oh, all God. I think they play drums. <laughs> right, you know. So... <laughs> Actually, dude, on the last gruesome tour, uh, Sebastian, the guitar player from Exhumed, is actually a badass drummer. So I had him play the song I wrote on guitar, and I got to play it on stage every night, which is super rad. I saw that video. Oh, that's cool. I, I love it. That's cool. Because that, cool. that, that guitar player is actually super talented. Sebastian is a musical genius. Legit. Yeah, that kid's good. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, who's next here? Who's next? Go ahead. Derek. Derek, go ahead. Well, hey, man. Um, <laughs> hey, man. Uh, hey, man. <laughs> Got to make uh, the T-shirts. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that, so that's a merchandising <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> yeah, Anton's in the go. chat. That's funny. Um, I don't I'm know. I mean, I guess my story. It only took a few minutes for him to chime in. Oh, God. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. My story may be kind of played out. People have probably heard this a million times, but, you know, coming from a musical family, uh, my brother's nine years older than me, but, you know, so he brought in the 70s Alice Cooper and Kiss and Black Sabbath and all of that into the house. But we, my mom and dad, you know, they, we listened to all types of music. We had a very musical household. And in the 80s, um, my dad was, he was writing some songs that he wanted to shop to uh, a couple of country artists and he ended up running into uh, a producer this guy john mccullough he had produced uh that song stay by maurice williams you know with the real high voice you you know um and he heard the song and he was like well you you can't sell these songs you need to you need to record these songs um so like in the early 80s i spent a few years with my dad in a recording environment and like a you know a really nice kind of what was a high end studio back then you know, and uh, this all makes cool sense. Yeah, right. I mean, it was a cool environment <laughs> totally. for to to check out, and um, yeah, I mean, and I, you know, my brother and my cousin and I were playing. I was I was playing in clubs by the time I was seven or eight years old, um, you know, and doing things with my brother and, and my cousin playing bass. My brother plays guitar. And, um, you know, we were doing everything for my mom in the neighborhoods, like garden club stuff. We'd play and we were doing covers. We do everything from like Allman Brothers, Doobie Brothers, Kansas, Boston, Kiss, of course. I mean, Leonard Skinner, you know, like the typical set late 70s stuff. Um, so I just had a lot of experience playing. Is there any beta days. max footage of this? <laughs> that, that, you know there actually is um that's something i really i need to try to find some of that stuff um yeah but i mean you know it started at an early age and i always say you know uh buddy rich was kind of one of my major influences when i was real young because like when tv would come on and you were watching this stuff you know at young and seeing it and I always say that, you know, Buddy Rich made me want to play drums, but Peter Chris made me want to play drums in front of people. Ah, wow. Ah, if, the, if that nice. makes sense, you know what I mean? Hear you, hear you. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of the, the catapult. And I remember as a kid, like, I wouldn't leave my kit set up in my bedroom. Like, I literally tore it down every night and set it up every day. And I don't know why I did that. Like, I didn't need to do that, but I just, the process of it, I just love so much. Again, I don't know if I was like, so much, I don't know so why I was preparing myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to you, it probably does because we spent so much oh time. Oh my God, it's, it's like a book. <laughs> well, I, was about, I was about to say, how long have we known each other? And we were freaking neighbors, and I didn't know you were playing clubs when you were eight years old. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I got see? some pictures somewhere. Actually, let me see. I might be able to pull something up. I'll show I you mean, listen. See this. I, I know Derek a long time, right? Like him and I go way back. We're pretty, we're pretty what, good friends. 25, Dude, 25, 26 years. Some Something shit like, like that. that. And every word he just said, I just sat there and went, of course. 
this because dude, like, the thing oh, all the, so another piece got, of the puzzle comes together. <laughs> well, dude, because like Derek, Derek understands drum sound, like few or no other. I call him the Oracle. Like he knows everything, <laughs> and uh, dude, you I mean, this, he's in a recording studio with things. his dad as a kid. Of oh, course, yeah. he comes out of that with a fucking ear like a hawk. Uh, <laughs> and awesome, with the setting up, your, setting up and tearing Thank down you. your kid thing too. When I when I first started with a band, oh. we rehearsed out in the in the carport, and it was like, yeah. all right, everybody, bring the kid out. You know, luckily we lived, we had cool neighbors, so we could you know play for two hours, whatever, no big deal. Yeah, right on. Ne- That's never so cool. too late. But yeah, it was always okay. You're gonna learn how to set up and tear down your kit every time you play it, so you know how to do it. And when the time comes, you're 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 uh, and you're playing gigs and stuff like that. You're gonna be in and out, and you're you're gonna know what to do. You know, so yeah, yeah well, it's Derek, valuable yeah. valuable stuff, man. It's funny when you said that, Derek, about Buddy Rich being your first, you know, you know, real influence, and then Peter Chris being the one that made you want to play. Uh, we had Elliot Hoffman and Ken Schalk on here a few weeks back, and. Uh, Ken right. Schalk said his favorite drummer was Animal, and he mentioned how him and Buddy Rich had the jam off on the Muppets, but yeah. the drummer that made him want to play was also Peter Chris. That's funny. Oh, of course. I mean, probably for most of us. I mean, <laughs> you know, who can't? Anybody our age, you know, that's undeniable, you know. And Ken and there were so, like We had so much music. <laughs> Make a load yeah. of jets. Everyone yeah. say hi to Jet. Hey, Jet. Hey, Jet. Hey, hey. Tar Nation. She rocks. Not the Tar Nation. All right, it's it's Bittner's turn. Oh, it's this it's the same thing that Derek Derek said earlier. It's, it's the it's the same played out story. Little kid from Schenectady goes big. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, I, I, I don't have a I have a, a definite musical upbringing of sorts, but I have a non musical family. I was the first one in my family. Uh, but I grew up in the seventies and my parents played a lot of music in the house. So, and I know that not necessarily was a, co- was a, was a common thing then, but, but it was what it was. But with, with, with everything that my dad listened to was mostly all the Southern rock stuff like Skinnerd, Marshall Tucker band, the Almond brothers, you know, ironically a couple bands with, you know, double drummers. So I was, uh, the Doobie Brothers. So I was attracted to yeah. just drums alone, just from that standpoint. Um, and my mother's taste in music was all the 60s stuff. So I was getting, you know, Ginger Baker with Cream, Mitch Mitchell with Hendrix. And she would like the Doors a lot too, but I didn't really care for the mm-hmm. Doors. But still, Ginger Baker and Mitch Mitchell were two huge influences. And my dad was a huge, huge, huge Who, who fan. So I okay, really yeah. think that if I really look at it, Keith Moon was the first guy that made me want to be a drummer because that was the first guy that I really kind of like, yeah. like paid attention to more. Like as far as the drums went, that was, I was like, he like made me like, you know, one ear went, well, what's this guy doing that, you know, and ironically, he ends up being my hero's favorite drummer because, you know, obviously everybody knows my favorite drummer is Neil Peart and Keith Moon was his favorite drummer growing up. <laughs> Keith Moon. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to Lombardo. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Jason's over here pouring out his soul. That was the beginning, but the really the first... So Keith Moon made me want to play drums. Then as soon as... As soon as I saw Kiss in 1976, I was six years old. I was like, holy shit, that, I want to be Gene Simmons. I didn't want to be Peter Chris. I wanted <laughs> to be Gene Simmons. I wanted to be the guy that spit blood and, and, and blew fire. It is so, cool. Uh, uh, so that, the plot thickens. That's, that's where that all started. So really that young, it was you know the toy drum sets, the toy guitars. I didn't know which one I wanted to play. I just wanted to be in a band. So eighth grade, I started taking drum lessons. Um, and I just started playing drums and that, that became my thing. There was only, there was a point in time where like when I was first getting into high school, I got a guitar and I was playing, trying to like play more guitar than I was drums. And I was like, Oh, maybe I'll change instruments. And then I realized that that would have been a 
real stupid move because <laughs> I was way better at drums than I am at guitar. I, I'm not fooling myself that much, but but there was a period in time where I I think that I was just uh, not disillusioned with playing drums, but I was I was enjoying playing guitar so much that I I had lost that uh, I had lost that that passion because I didn't want to just be in in school taking lessons and stuff like that and. I I was just coming out of the rush phase and I needed the next phase and then thrash metal came so that kind of like oh, yeah. that kind of spun me back out of uh out of the guitar playing mode of me like learning Hendrix songs to like you know trying to play along to Raining Blood which I got that record in 86 <laughs> and and it's funny that you mentioned that record Gus being so influential because everything yep. about that record you still you still remember it like you, you fucking heard it the first time yesterday. It, it, it's very plain as day. And and that yep. record for me, I had taken it. We had gone on a, like spring break vacation. It might have been like it probably was. It was probably February 87 because I saw them shortly after open for Wasp. But sadly, Lombardo wasn't there because that was the first period in time where TJ Pepperoni was playing drums or whatever. I, all I know is ah, the double I forgot about that guy. <laughs> there was there was no double bass fill in Angel of Death. So, so oh, I remember, I remember, <laughs> I remember, <laughs> oh man, that, they, <laughs> Jason they takes that personally. And then they went right into like Epidemic or something. They played the drum fill for that instead of playing the actual. Oh song. right, I think I saw a video of that. I wonder and, and, what the and, heck and is going I on. Because <laughs> I was waiting for it. I'm like, oh, of course this guy can't do it. Anyway, oh, so, man. Uh, so we, had gone, we had gone on vacation like February 87 and I and we went down to we went to, to Disney or to Orlando and all I did that whole entire week was listen, listen to Rain and Blood back and forth because I had the auto reverse <laughs> reverse Walkman and it was only 32 minutes aside anyway. So I would just walk around. Oh, uh, I remember to that. that. Record. I. Dude, I had that record down, air drumming. Oh, man. The moment that I got up, got home and got on the kit and tried to play it for real, I went, oh, my God, this is going to be a lot harder than I thought. And it was. I mean, Random, Random Blood for me is my alpha and omega. Like, that's the record that 100%, like, pinpoint changed my whole life. Like, I started, you know... I started playing this, all the songs on guitar, but the drums just kept like, and it, for me, it was the snare drum. I love hearing that. Bah, 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 bah. It just had so much aggression. And, uh, and of course, like the double kick break on Angel of Death was, you know, eventually like the drums just like, because in like thrash, it's, the drums are so vicious. And then I heard like Darkness Descends. And I, then I was like, okay, I'm beating the shit out of these things. This is like, yeah. you know, and you're just trying to get out that aggression and that music just like just gave you such an outlet that as much as I love guitar and I love playing guitar and I'm probably currently in a thing like you were where I'm like, do I like guitar more or do I like drums more? I don't know. But back then, dude, the drums were like, they were just, they were like the gateway, like to like everything I like is from these fucking, from this instrument. And, uh, you know, that is something that whether I want to play drums currently now or not, that reverence never goes away. I will always, like, respect what the drums have done for me, for sure. I'm going to jump. Excellent, by the way. I'm going to jump in because there's, I'm going to take the timeline and just kind of throw it away for a minute already. Um, just because of a lot of the talk that's been going on with Double Bass and Angel of Death and Slayer and everything else. So uh, we're just going to take a a quick little break here and I'm going to play a video. Most people probably haven't seen it, but I'm sure some can. Um, so if you got a, anyone who wants to get a drink or something, this video is a few minutes long. We're going to actually, before I do that, let's take a quick look at one of our sponsors and I'll, we'll be right back in like 15 seconds. The most technically advanced drummers in the world require the most technologically advanced drum heads. Bit of a no brainer when you think about it. In any case, we're more than happy to oblige. All right, now.
now we're going to jump into this video that's very fitting to the conversation that's been going on for the past 10 minutes. So uh, now, don't worry, you'll be, you'll be muted automatically when this starts, but I will see you in a couple minutes. <laughs> Enjoy.
Texas Metal. <laughs> Yeah, that kid. I can see the wor- I can see the worry on your face. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> hey, what, coming up to that? Idea, guys. Let's go play one of the hardest thrash songs ever to play with no warming up on a pedal that is totally foreign to you. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Sounded, Dude, sounded good though. You know the, how about the semi hollow I had to use to fucking play Slayer? Remember that shit? It was know, funny. Yeah, give me that. Part, give me that semi hollow. That video. This is the best part of that video was the introduction because Anton made the video so nice with the go thanks to GoPro logo and our friends at this great booth. We had so much fun and we're going to go back and do it next year. But next year it was wah, wah, wah. Who are you guys? Get the, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. I, don't don't remember all that. Funny. I just remember like five minutes before that, somebody saying, hey, let's go to the GoPro booth and bust a song out. I was like, all right. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> we were trying to get Scott Patrick, who's in chat, to play bass on it that day, but uh, all right, yeah, Scott. Yeah, he was with he was there there for the for the playing of the song, but he uh, he was not there. He was not in, involved in it, sadly. Right, right. I got Does have I a got bass amp or some shit. I don't remember. What's I got that? two Man, questions. Can we take from a- Matt. I got two questions for Matt because I feel like. The freaking three amigos over here are just fun. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's tough because I used to I used to live down there with those guys half the, half, basically like half the year. So it's like I saw them all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, believe me. Like I said, Matt, this is the first time I'm actually meeting Matt on the Internet. I've known you guys. Actually, me and Derek and Jason all played on the same compilation album in like 2005. Yeah, yep. which is wow. which is freaking legendary. Chris Adler, yeah. Chris Penny, uh, Ken Shock, yep. um, freaking Jordan Mancino, Justin Foley. So oh, nice. many guys that are just, you know, part of some of the most wow. what have become now over the past 18 years. That's it's crazy to imagine that it's been that long. <laughs> Um, that wow. have are all you know cemented as legends, you know, uh, your, yourselves included, you included as well, Gus and Matt. I, I I was curious, what number one, what is the drink you're drinking, and number two, uh, what is a iconic album to you that really really set wheels in motion that wasn't necessarily Slayer? Let's I'm I'm trying to get a different. Let's let's see if we can get a different answer and. Uh, and see what uh, for, what was what, a game oh, changer. Boy. Oh, uh, Drum Nation Volume Three, and it you were, was you know you were let fifteen them, then, right? I was fifteen, yeah. Uh, I think maybe fourteen when I recorded. I think fifteen when it came out, something like that. Wow, it's like um, uh, Weckerman Junior on the Infected <clears throat> Group. <laughs> <laughs> it was a blessing, man, to be amongst all these guys. Like I said, still to my day. Uh, are my heroes you know it's i'm i don't take any bit of it for granted ever and uh it's something that it's easy to forget about as you're 18 years later you know what i mean all these things happen you record on all these other things you play all these other shows and then you think back like whoa like this actually happened like i was among considered amongst my peers um you know for for this album and it was uh it was truly a blessing so yeah, I'm really grateful to be able to say I share that space with uh, these legends, baby. I'm glad I picked you as a co-moderator because you're you're killing it already. It's like you're on, <laughs> you're on Twitch so often. It's like you know you got that you got that uh, position it, in, in, in it totally up. It's it was pro a wrestling. Question. You know what I mean? I'm it's just pro take wrestling. The and I wrote earlier and just kind of throw it out. That was a good question, <laughs> um, yeah. Matt. Yeah, if you want to answer that question from Rain, and that'd be. And every time, Gus, I'm sorry, you say rain and blood, I, I kept thinking you were saying his last name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's Bazio. It's not blood, dude. <laughs> anyway, um, Matt, Matt, the question was, uh, go ahead, say it again. It iconic album that maybe, um, I think was you're that new. Album that or was it like, what, was it you guys with the bands or what was going it, on? With it that? was a little bit of everything, but it was your kind of your solo project, not necessarily the band that you're known for. We didn't, there was not a shadows fall track. There wasn't as I lay drying, you know, it wasn't, it was these guys got together with maybe some other musicians or in some cases composed all their music themselves and performed it all themselves. Um, which is also incredible. I know in, in, in many cases, um, you know, 
Uh, so I, I got together with my guitar player friend. Jason got uh, back with one of his bands. Uh, Derek, I can't remember exactly. Did you did you perform on that stuff, or did you get a did you get a guest no. musician? No, yeah, all that was me. all you. Yeah, all see, right. yeah, and Ken, yeah, Ken. I know he did his whole track, and that was crazy. He had like oh, DJ yeah. scratching and all sorts of wild. It stuff. It was so good, I mean? so cool. Yeah, man. Or, uh, that all was right. for uh, that was for Magna Carta. Yeah, yeah. Magna Carta, kombucha, baby, yeah. love it. Or love the kombucha. Baby. This guy's got good gut health. You can tell from that drink. <laughs> He's a, a pro. I told it. <laughs> <laughs> what was that question you had about the iconic album, Rain? And I think that might be good for not only Matt to, to throw an answer at, but everybody real quick. Yeah, what, what was an iconic album? Because we we've all been talking about Rain and Blood. Obviously, we know how, uh, how much of a game changer that was. What was one for you specifically? Because I'd like I know about you the least. Out of all these guys, I, like I said, I've been friends with Derek and Jason since I was 14, 15 years old. Gus since I was probably about 21. So, you know, we're, we're going on some long times with these guys. But you, I, I don't know enough. So I, you're the biggest mystery to me. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I want to, cr let's crack it open. You know what I mean? Rain and blood. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong with that. You can't is go Gus wrong. frozen or does he just agree a lot? <laughs> I wanted to say a couple other things, right? Gus said the left hand. I, I, I'm going to say the right hand. The right hand freaked me out on Rain and Blood. Also, Rain and Blood made me quit smoking cigarettes for the first time. And wow. I also want to talk about Thrash and like Metallica Messer and Puppets and then Rain and Blood that kind of took it up, uh, you know, a, a bunch of notches. But like those albums and that movement represented to me uh, I, I was able to relax because up until then it was kind of Motley Crue. And then there was a lot of like spandex and hairspray and makeup, which I could not do. And I was depressed because I did not think I would be able to be able, I didn't think I'd be able to play rock music as a drummer. And I kind of got depressed because I wasn't going to put on fucking spandex. And then like the thrash movie came out and there was Lars with jeans and white high tops, you know, and that's what, how I dressed and, and it really made me relax. But as an album that just to shift gears, I'll put out Big Swing Face. Ah. Tell, tell us more about that. Big Swing Face. Who is that by? Yeah, but a big is that the band? Is, right. So Buddy Rich like um, freaked me out too when I was a little kid. Um, and but then after that it was um, Permanent Waves got me in a rush, and I was in a rush a lot, and I was and. Like for me, like Neil Peart was the drummer I listened to, and I thought of him as staccato. And Alex Van Halen was the drummer that I listened to, and I thought of him as legato. And I figured like both were pieces wow. of a bigger puzzle. And then the reason I decided to be a drummer, you guys said Peter Chris. For me, you know, my dad he worked for NPR, and he knew the head of the um, the the company. It was called National Sound, and they got me backstage to the Signals concert when I was uh, eighty two. In eighty two, I was twelve. Um, they got me back spectrum in Philadelphia. So I got to um, wow. stand behind me, hit about 10 feet back. And I was able to go out into the front row. And back then, I don't know if you guys remember, like Rush would play two nights uh, in some cities. They always played two nights in Philly. So I, w I went both nights. And after those two nights, you know, that's when I decided to be a drummer. So I'll say um, Big Swing Face, Permanent Waves. Uh, how about Van Halen 2 and... Permanent waves and then signals via moving pictures. There's I mean, one I feel, out. I feel like all those guys are on um, all of our lists <laughs> it, it, at one point, at least in the top twenty. You know what I mean? Those are you can't go wrong with Alex Van Halen, Dave Lombardo, yep. Buddy Rich, like Neil Peart. You know what I mean? They're 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 icons of their era. Keith Moon, as we were speaking of earlier. You know, Eric, um, Peter, Chris. You know, uh, so many people are willing to dog on him, but like you said, he's he's the one who made you want to, you know, play and drums. Influence. You know what I mean? Yeah, influence. That's yeah. the thing, man. Influence. Yeah, I mean, that's you can't deny that when I mean, you move that many people to play an instrument and to get involved in music. I don't. You can't yep. slag these guys. You know, like absolutely. Uh, and Lars, I mean, Lars, Lars is one of my favorite yeah. drummers. I mean, just 
<clears throat> I mean, think of all the cool stuff that he played over the years that's just unique to him alone, you know? I mean... And not only that, but as a kind of co-writer, producer type, the way exactly. he, you know, I can really relate to in that I don't necessarily write a whole bunch of songs, but if you come to me with a bare bones idea, I can make it happen. I can I can jazz it up. I could tell you what I want you to play and give that's you stuff where theme. it was like, yeah, yeah, we know I about we end song up, structure. We know about We end up phrasing. being the arrangers. Yep, we end up yep. being the arrangers usually yep. in our bands. I've and Lars that. is perhaps the great, yeah. I mean, single his yeah. single greatest attribute to music is his arrangement abilities. And, and how he and, plays the rise cymbal. Yeah, and it and it reflects on his, yeah, on his what playing. Rise? Um, you know I mean? Thank you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he just got a new one, didn't he? he? Just, I think he just caved. No, yeah, on a new tour. He, he doesn't. No, yeah, he, he doesn't no, have a ride. One of the kits. One of the kits has a ride that he plays on. That I know. Uh, I saw it. Song. Really? Yeah, yeah, it's it's one of the kits. Has oh a ride. wow! Yeah, I didn't know that. Yep. I did some digging a few months back because someone stumped me with it, and I was I could have sworn there was ride symbol on at least one song from. Uh, Master or um, Ride the Lightning. But oh, there is, there is, there's there Ride is. Up, up, did, until, the, the up ride until. Was, yeah. The Ride didn't leave until Justice. Right. This is what but, I found yeah. out. Hey, it came back for like load and reload and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me rewind a bit, if you don't mind, Matt, when you were talking about, um, you know, permanent waves and, and signals and whatnot. It reminded me of an interview that you and I did at NAM a few years back, um, shortly after you know Neil's passing, uh, rest in peace. And you had told me a little bit more on that story, like the amount of times you have seen Rush and all the all the Rush you've studied and all the albums you can play up to a certain point. Can you kind of talk about that real quick while we're still on on that topic? Yeah, I remember that interview pretty well. You uh, said you had yeah, a beer at different times because you had a beer when you were like eight. At this at this venue or ten or something or twelve whatever. anyway go ahead I'm sorry <laughs> different times oh, something like the after party at the signal show and they were in there I I didn't know what to say I went up to Nicole and I said good show you know he's like hey that's kinda... and I had a Heineken Dark you, you guys remember Heineken Dark <laughs> yeah they used to have that at bars yeah that was cool remember like it was yesterday eighty two. Nobody tried to swat that out of your hand. Neil was just like, oh, it's, it's an eight-year-old kid with a beer. Who cares? <laughs> well, it's the 70s, were, baby. It, it wasn't a big deal back then for, for kids to like be in bars with dads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah, so wild. Really man. Just to, to think about that happening nowadays, just the horror. The, yeah. <laughs> the absolute horror. Oh. Right. But going back into how many times was, you've actually seen them in concert, that was a cool Cool bit. Uh, I've seen him 19 times. Wow. Wow. Awesome. Amazing. <laughs> it, it's not that, man. I, I, would I, might, I might have you beat. Uh. <laughs> might. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It, 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 it'll be close. But, uh, yeah. You guys I are going to kill me. I saw him four times on Test for Echo Tour alone. Uh -uh. <laughs> test for echo test for echo basically neil's comeback tour for the month. i see what you did there <laughs> yeah i lost track of them so you know I, I it was kind of um i was moving on to different things and um and and hold your fire was kind of I hate to say like not kind of like their black album for me <laughs> I loved uh, I loved the Hold Your Fire stuff live, and that's kind of where first, I, I left off. First of all, Rush has never put out a black album. They've never put out <laughs> something that terrible <laughs> that, that I that I went, "What is this?" And never played. There's never been a Rush album that came out that I never not played again. You know what I'm saying? There's 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 a few of those Metallica records. Black album, all right, that got more play years later. Load, reload, forget it. Saint Anger. All those, all those, up until right now, those are all coasters. There's not one. There might have been. There, there might have been Rush albums uh, where I'm like, all right, this Slayer has uh, coasters. Like when you're like listening to it, you're like, it's still my favorite band. You got What about what about Big Money? <laughs> 
That's, that's great whatever stuff. that whatever that album was from. That one was pretty hardcore. They all oh, had really. They awesome. already had the worst. They all had the worst mullets you could ever see. And then it's like, okay, at least Neil. <laughs> you're thinking at least Neil hey, doesn't have, have a mullet, right? For and work, he's rocking. <laughs> oh, we we could get started on that. Believe me, I'll go all day long. But I just I love the fact that Neil has short hair, so you're like, oh, okay, at least Neil doesn't have the mullet. And then he kind of no. does a wave, and you oh, see the braid. And then, and oh he's god! The tail, and you're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> there was some cultivation happening with that tail. I I love that. You know, I love that era of freaking music and time, and the fact that everybody was a victim. Nobody got free of the '80s bug. It was like you, every it's, if you were a jazz artist, you could have been any kind of artist. And in the '80s, you put out an album with a shit ton of reverb on the snare. You put out an <laughs> album with a bunch of synth, and you tried to sing. You know what I mean? Like freaking. I don't know. You know you, what I mean? You, it's you, like you could get away with everything. Let's put it that way. Yeah, they all basically started making new jack swing albums. You're like, okay, all bets were off. <laughs> Everyone, even Rush put out a new Jack Swing album. That's what I'm saying. It was all. <laughs> so, Jason, um, same question that uh, Rainin asked previously. Let's iconic albums. You know, I don't want I'm not going to go and, and pick the same ones that I, you know, and like, try, oh, well, Marvish New Intermounting Flame. I, 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 I'm just going to, I'm going to go with the first, with the first record again that I can remember in my timeline that was not metal, but was extremely influential in me wanting to be a drummer. And I probably still played those. I could probably fudge my way through those songs better playing them at 10, 11, 12 years old than I could now. And that's Ghost in the Machine by the Police. Nice. That that and Zenyatta Mandata because I was a huge Stuart Copeland fan. Like before MTV hit, you know, like buying 45s and stuff like that. Again, another drummer that I was really taking note of. And it wasn't until a few years later when, when I discovered Rush, when, you know, then it was oddly enough, another three piece band, but you know, <clears throat> the police was the first was, that was the first, the first thing that wasn't a, a hard rock, heavy metal record that made me want to go, okay, I like this. <laughs> I, I want to do some more of this. It really wasn't until I got into. Really, I started discovering all the other drummers, like all the names that we that we all, you know, had in our upbringing. Kyle Yuta, Steve Smith, obviously Raynan's dad, a huge influence. Um, but Steve even dad. for me, my first my first influence with with Terry was was seeing Missing Persons. I didn't I didn't even know about Frank Zappa and, and all that stuff until, you know, years later. But like all those players, like learning about all these players, Simon Phillips, Billy Cobham, Dave Weckl, the, the the list goes on and on. All those really didn't come into play for me until probably like while I was getting into metal because that's when I was just becoming like a sponge as far as drumming was was concerned. And it wasn't that yeah, I was a metalhead, but I was listening to all different kinds of music and just trying to be the best drummer I could be, even though that I knew that <clears throat> the thrash realm was definitely the way that I was going. <clears throat> you know, you could be a kid playing in jazz band, but you know, if you're if you're if you're a metal kid playing in jazz band is different than the jazz kid trying to play in a metal band, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And, and it's, it's great that you say that because that's so true. Metal drumming so many times is that gateway to discovering the, the players and yeah. being like, okay, you know what? It doesn't matter what genre they play for. I want to hear sick drummers because yep. you can apply that to your metal drumming, you know, always. <laughs> that's and that's how I, that's the way I, I, you know, was, was looking at that stuff. But again, it was being a child of the eighties too. And growing up with MTV when MTV was actually a music station yeah. and got yeah. so much great different kinds of music at the same time. Like you could see, you know, David Bowie and the selector and the English beat and then Iron Maiden would be on right after it. Like what? And mm -hmm. 
and it mm-hmm. it was but that was the norm before it became you know what it became but it, it allowed you to okay to boomer have, it's funny too because you know prior to that there was a lot of other types of music out there and bands and big bands and this and that where you didn't really know the numbers the the drummer's name because it was some hired studio guy you would never even have heard of but then in the influx of all these newer bands that you're talking about the who and zeppelin and rush and everybody else we actually got to put a face to a name then you got your you got your you know neil peart that you can latch on to and there was a name there uh, whereas before, a lot well, I, think, of stuff, I think I think Keith, Keith have Boone kind of Keith Boone kind of pioneered that like I'm the drummer and I'm cool thing. Like I well, think it's pretty first safe first to say, say he was the first. What about Ringo? Well, <laughs> in rock and roll, I mean, the guys look at I mean, right in rock and roll. Uh, yeah, I mean, look at the. I, mean, I guess like a, in general, and like a, numbers, in the you know, in the public eye, you know, like in the general public, I guess. Yeah, but Ringo yeah, never but- commanded that. I don't think that Ringo never commanded that on stage. He never commanded to look at me. I'm the drummer. He just smiled and was like, "Look at me. I'm the fourth Beatle." You know. Yeah, Keith Moon so definitely also, did. He was also Moon doing it. No, I'm agreeing with you. But I, yeah. you know, I, I didn't see Ringo in that light. Yes, Ringo influenced influenced thousands of drummers, but he wasn't. It didn't seem like he was going at it from a. A well, drumming if, perspective, per se. If, if there was social media back then, that would have been a different answer. You know what I mean? <laughs> he couldn't go at it like we do now because he didn't have the tools. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah, but also freaking well, John and Paul. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, Here, end of. <laughs> well, the tools are different now, though, and this is, like I think, a bigger systemic problem than music in general. The tool is exactly the same. It's the heart. Yeah. And I'm yep. not, and I'm not saying that there's not enough musicians that are playing with heart or anything like that. But the intent of music today is completely different than it was 40 years ago, 60 years ago. You know, Absolutely. so, so you have to take that intent in mind. You know, um, chicks. You know, just I, I wanted to bring up something too. Just <laughs> talking about like influential records, let's say. Um, but I'll, I'll take it a step further and say like just instrumental things that changed my drumming right through history so the first one being discovering buddy rich and wanting to play the second one being peter chris doing it in front of people and wanting to perform um and then as i was growing you know discarded started like discovering who the drummers were that were playing on the records in the household um that was a big part of of discovery um uh when eric carr joined kiss that was a big developmental stage for me because like he really upped the game. Um, so that was something that happened. And then something that somebody that nobody has mentioned right now, the advent of modern drummer magazine that really, really, really expanded my world. Um, as a, as a yeah. player, you know, I was already, was already listening to, you know, Gad and, and, Cauda and and Basio and now all of that stuff was already in the house, so I was familiar with all of that stuff when I was very young. Um, and I discovered, you know, metal later as stuff started being developed. You know, getting into Celtic Frost or you know originally Hell uh, Hellhammer or discovering Slayer and I, you know, those albums. Let's not just single out Rain and Blood, but let's just single the whole movement. You know, Metallica and Dark Angel Gene and. Paul Boss stuff was forbidden. And, you know, there were so many guys back then that, like, they kind of shaped that. And that whole movement for me, um, you know, propelled me into Napalm Death, which led to me doing what I'm doing now for the most part, you know. I mean, of course, Pete and Morbid Angel and all. But this was, like, me later. So I'm kind of, like, reverse. Like, I discovered all of the drummers, drummers early and were familiar with them and, like, g- grew into metal because it just didn't exist. You know, it's like when I was coming yeah, up, I was kind a of polar opposite of that. Scene. Right, but you, and, and you have hey, to eternal. You know, oh, there you go. There you go. And you <laughs> have to say the same thing about Sick Drummer, Ian. You know, because like Sick Drummer magazine opened up a whole world to an entire generation of drummers that would have normally like the guys that weren't like reading the modern drummers. Like when I was really young, I didn't really have any interest in that. Once I discovered metal, I was like, eh. I want to know more about all these crazy drummers, you know, but, um, you, know, you guys were the drummer, first, you, you know, guys were the first that? ones to have the drum cam stuff where it was like, it's freaking behind the drummer 
we're seeing everything. I mean, you know, maybe not the first first, but I remember seeing it on the internet and this being like a thing where you can actually really see these guys playing these things and and see what they're doing and see how they're doing it. And that was such an eye opener and so cool. Um, yeah, to this day, man, you got got to give some. Credit. I would say on the internet aspect, sick drummer yeah, really Ian, took over. Yes, it's, it's sick drummer and Ian were definitely the great unifier of the the whole community. You know what I mean? Like they kind of brought us all under one umbrella where everybody could communicate and discover and share and learn and and progress, man. I, you know, <laughs> it's a big deal, man. <laughs> It is. For real. All right. So, yep. thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. I got the feels right, right here. Iconic album, Ooh. Gus. Oh, um, I mean, I would say my most important album outside of metal is Ten, Ten Summoner's, Summoner's Tales. Tales. From <laughs> <laughs> I, knew it. Uh, I mean, that's just the, uh, the the game changer, man. What is it? Sorry, but, somebody was talking over you. Ten yeah. Summoner's Tales from uh, Sting, Sting. Vinny Caliuta. There you go, Vinny. And uh, and that record, I uh, you know I so like the opposite of Derek. I started as a total metal drummer, and uh, my first drum teacher was Dave Colross. So um, shout out to Dave if he's uh, watching, uh, or even Little Dave. Um, but Dave like he was the one that started to like really introduce me to, to that whole vibe. And, um, you know, like lay the found it's Dave, Dave Koros definitely like changed my life for sure. And, and so that, and along with that, I would say the eternal record from, from malevolent, cause that was a huge influence on me at the time. Um, and then beyond that, when I started studying with Sean, so obviously like human was like a, you know, so like Derek said, for me, Daniel Lombardo made me want to play drums. Human made me want to learn drums and be a better student and a better player of the instrument. So with that record absolutely changed my life too, for sure. Absolute game changer. I remember the first time I heard it, well, a friend on. had like Sorry, this. Me too. While I got you soloed up here, Gus, I'll just throw right. this up. Um, question for you. What's your favorite death metal band? Is it death and who else? Well, I got you soloed. Obituary. I don't even have to think obituary, dude. <laughs> DT. DT is still to this day in my top five, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Love it. Okay, now I want to switch up the question a little bit here. <laughs> Go ahead, moderator. We we all talked about some some iconic albums and stuff that we love from the past and and to to Gus's point about the uh, OK Boomer, this is something that I thought about <laughs> I, when I thought about some questions I wanted to ask this group of guys. You know, um, I didn't think about this one till kind of last minute, like maybe an hour or so before, and I was like, oh, you know what? What about the stuff that's coming out now? Stuff that's come out within the past three years or so. You know what I mean? Some brand new stuff where you're like, wow, these guys are... I know it's hard to change the game nowadays. You know what I mean? So much stuff has been done, but somehow people are still doing it. And I, I want to know what... Guys. Yeah, what's some new stuff that has come out recently that's inspired you guys that's been like, wow, this is this is some cool stuff. And, and even somebody who's, you know younger than us or, or, or whatever, you know, there's, there's still so much great, cool music being made. So I'm really curious. Cause like a couple that have, uh, that have piqued my interest lately. Uh, one of which is knocked loose and they're just like a really heavy kind of metal core. Uh, not, it's nothing, nothing, uh, too complicated. You know what I mean? They just keep it simple yet. It's so refreshing and it's, it sounds so new you know, somehow, even though it's stuff that we've all kind of heard before. Um, so I, I really like those guys. And then I checked out this artist called Jiraiya recently, which on my stream, my Twitch stream, I was able to learn about it from getting a, a song request. And it's like yeah, this, this kid, from, kid from Brooklyn, um, a black kid who sounds like Mike Patton, you know what I mean? And plays that kind of style of music, totally breaking nice. the mold of what you would think 
you know, nowadays with all the hip hop and stuff like that, this guy's making interesting, unique rock music. Um, you know what I mean? Which I, I think is really cool. And yeah, it's all, it's kind of all over the place has these elements of, you could tell he loved anime and all these kind of things growing up yet. You could tell he was listening to Mike Patton and, and all that kind of crazy Mr. Bungle type stuff. And, and somehow what he's doing is, is even though it's, it's familiar, it still sounds so new and so fresh and so cool. Um, so those are two artists that I've, I've really been digging, uh, that have, that have been, you know, more right. recent, more recent bands. So let's, let's kick it over to, uh, let's start with, uh, with Matt. Uh, that's kind of a tough question. I try to listen to a lot of stuff, but I like the, um, I, I like the, uh, the new bow kind of funk stuff that, that a lot of it came from, uh, Denton and Brooklyn, like Snark Puppy and. Yeah. And uh, stuff like that, like Nick Wood and all that stuff. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Death Metal, I think Entheos is pretty interesting to me. Animals mm. as Leaders. Is yeah, cool. my boy. Naveen's are, one of my best friends in the world. All, yeah, all the love to Naveen too. and Chaney. All Incredible. the love to Naveen and Chaney from uh, Entheos. Naveen's some a great really, player. Some really close friends of mine. And, and uh, yeah, some I think some of the most talented musicians. I totally back the Entheos for sure. Yeah, they're they're really um, they're making a really great effort. I think. Sweet. And the drummer writes all the stuff. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Naveen, Naveen writes it all, man. He's a freaking you know, just like all these freaking cats. Genius. Sounds like the aside. <laughs> Who else you got, man? The last freaking master. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Keep getting better. Um. Oh. What else? Things everything I mentioned, so I yeah, yeah Matt, your mic's cutting out. You're Sorry, breaking you're, up a little bit. You're breaking up a lot with your mic. Got something wrong with your mic? It's cutting in and out quite a bit. Let's take two, two. There we go. One, two. That worked. I thought that was me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right. I'm, I'm, just I'm glad it's not me. Twenty <laughs> more things. Oh. Every time he says something important, it cuts out. That's yeah, we're having some issues <laughs> with your mic there. That's what, um, what about you, Derek? That. You said you had something something loaded up. He said he had a bunch of names. Well, I like <laughs> shit that nobody can listen to. You know, um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, and, hey, and Matt, I yeah, I I saw Matt posted one of my all-time favorites the other day you were messing around with some sleepy time gorilla museum stuff and like those guys to me that are some it. of the most that was the band name <laughs> yeah 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 i i mean all of that stuff those guys are great man they're great um, amazing absolutely incredible band i mean it's like it's very bizarro stuff but um you know i kind of and and even that's 20 25 years old Although they are redoing a tour here, they're they have they've been broke up since like 2007, so they're doing some stuff here coming up this year, which is cool. They had a knockoff band called Free Salamander Exhibit that's extremely good <laughs> as well. <laughs> I know. No, these bands are awesome. Yeah. No, hey, this band right here. I can't even see that. What is it? Pineal. Pineal. Dude, I'm making put my glasses on. They are look, My man. This is two. This is two bands. That's one band, right? So two drummers, two guitar players, two bass players, and a keyboard player. And it is some of the most insane, like th the shit that some of that these dudes are pulling off. I mean, the drums. It's like listening in a in a headphone environment. It's like a tennis match. You know, <laughs> like have, sometimes this guy would be playing the kick line and this dude snare. Sometimes they're doing natural delay to do that, that, to do that, that, that kind of stuff. And wow. How is it, it spelled? Man, it, uh, P I N I O L. P I N I O L. When you first brought yeah, up on from, the screen, I thought it was Pelini. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're from France. Uh, Pineapple. They're from France. Uh, <laughs> they're uh, extremely good. There's a whole, like, the whole genre of stuff, you know, like from Universe Zero. I mean, there's. There's so many bands that I'm discovering recently. I mean, like I said, a lot of these bands are 20 years old or, or even older, but it's just stuff that I'm gravitating back towards right now. New stuff, I don't – I mean, man, I, again, remember what I said about intent earlier, about the intent and in music has changed? 
And I kind of feel like the intent specifically with metal, you know, has changed a lot over the years. And I'm just not, I'm just not attracted to it anymore. And I don't know if that's Your necessarily fault. a, I don't know if it's a necessarily a boomer thing. Your you know? fault, Derek. Um, <laughs> what's that <laughs> what's what do you mean it's your fault dude <laughs> what do you what do you mean dude? <laughs> you're the reason why metal is you, you know I, I, I yeah but I, I, I don't that, like i don't i don't <clears throat> grin my stuff or sound replace it or try to make it perfect oh, that's what I'm talking uh, of about. i love the speed part of yeah, it that's yeah. great i love to see how fast a drummer can play I just don't care how fast they can play if it sounds like a mouse running across a countertop. Agree. You know, man, like it's, so. I it's, hear it's, you, man. You gotta have the, some power. The, you gotta have a the little intent. You play those things. Yeah. No. The I totally. In, the intent. The intent has changed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, I just don't connect with it anymore because of that. And it's nobody's fault. I'm not saying anything like whatever. These drug, new, a lot of the newer drummers are fucking fantastic. That's not the point. The point is, is the for me, I've lost a connection to it because I can't hear the artist anymore. I want to hear, I want to hear the, I want to hear that drummer snare drum sound. I don't care about that drummer who's got some other dude sample on their drum. I don't. That you've lost me at that point because well, that's not why I listen to it. I listen to it to hear the musician. I can speak for I, all of you when I say yeah. speed is nothing without power. And each one of you guys are known speed is for nothing without intent. Well, intent too, but to have to have some something behind it, bro. I guess intent can translate to power. But exactly. um, when you're just yeah, like you said, when you're just tapping the drums, that takes a lot of the fun out of playing the drums, right? You want to you want to be able to hit it. And not to say that you got to freaking break about... every stick and every symbol on every hit or every head. You don't have to fucking right. blast it, you know, go out of control, but to have something where it's like, oh, there's a tangible element to the drums. You you have a really great point there. I, I totally totally right. agree. What and again, you? it's not about it's not about tapping or you know that kind of thing. It's just I think that like the the mental game has has shifted, and that's look, that's cool. It's just not for me. You right, know what, what about, I mean? So what about Jason here? Let's get this. Let's move over to Jason real quick here. I'm going to take another break here in a minute, but I want each person to answer this real quick before I do. I don't, I don't know if you want to gravitate over to the grumpy old man in the corner. Because All right, I, so let's I, go back over to Gus then. Yeah, straight up. Straight up I have, you guys know me. I have no qualms about saying what's on my mind. I don't like any new dance. I, don't, I, I try. I try. I don't want to name. I don't want to name names either, but I think yeah, there's right. been bands already alluded to in this conversation like the mice running across the table with a band that i always keep hearing about the double bass and blah blah, blah. and when i hear i click on a track to check it out and i hear what sounds like this <laughs> what the fuck is that and, and i know someone's gonna fucking go oh he's saying that because he can't do it i can't do it because there's no musical application yeah. of any band that I play in that needs. And, and that's what it sounds like. It doesn't sound like, it doesn't Amen. sound like that. It, it doesn't. A so, fucking man. I'm totally with that. Said, that being said, I, I go, this is what I do. I try to listen to new bands and when it, and when it fails, I go back and I try bands that maybe I'll give them a second chance. Maybe I'll like them again. So I've gone down the massive black metal wormhole over the last year and a half. So like Derek was just saying, some of these bands are 20 years old. One of my favorite fucking records right now that I've only found out about like six months ago is, is Sons of Northern Darkness by Immortal. So that's probably <laughs> been the most played record that's been played in my car or anywhere that I've been for the last six months has been that. Uh, the last two Crowbar records and some of the latest Prong demos that are uh, Prong, uh, half the record that Tommy sent me to let me hear half before it came out. That's Sons, about it. Sons of Northern Darkness, absolutely iconic. And playing yep. fast with intent. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. And, and Gus, let's kick it over to you for the last... Before before a commercial break. 
<laughs> not to rush you or uh, anything, but you know, there's a commercial uh, right after. My my answer is going to be super unpopular, but I, for the last like three and a half years, have made a living as a full time singer, guitar player. So, if it, it's for, after being a professional full time drummer for like twenty five years, and I'm on this complete Dave Grohl like switcheroo, um, I got to tell you, man, like the the Sleep Token record. Yes, I has just floored me because of the dude. The, that vocalist is so like, dude, brave and like fearless. And it's because now as a singer, man, I I don't care what anybody says. I, you know, if you don't like them, I don't give two fucks. That shit is impressive, and dude. the way that dude sings has just <laughs> floored me. I've been on that kick for months. Every night I listen to it. And did you see him on the? Well, actually, it wasn't him. Uh, uh, Will Ramos, the singer for Lorna Shore, was on the Charismatic Voice on YouTube. The the opera singer lady who yeah does, they, they do like they do like reactions or whatever. Yes, yes, yes. So she had Will Ramos in her studio, um, and he did. He's got a video out there if you search it after this, um, doing chokehold from Sleep Token. The dude oh from yeah, Lorna yeah, Shore. yeah, I saw it. yeah, it dude, is, it's good, man. It is so so good, so good, definitely so, good. Who I else? Agree. So, so you know, and what's, and I will say this too. At some point here, I, what's one thing I want to say to all you motherfucking drummers out there? I have spent the last three and a half years of my life being the guy on the other side, and you know, I, I, I I've learned so much about what it is to be a good drummer in like music, not a good drummer in your studio by yourself a good drummer that plays with other human beings and everybody in that band is like, thank God that dude's playing drums. That's what it's really all about. If you want to be a, a performer, so at the end of the day, it's about being a musician that plays drums, not a drummer, so to speak. And that's one of the biggest fucking things I've learned in the last three years. And it's, yeah, like, it's, well, it's, it's influenced my drumming totally. And I think that lends itself to the whole diversity thing. You know what I mean? Trying to play, go outside of your comfort zone, playing different styles of music. It's whatever it is, it's going to make you better. You know what I mean? And even if you don't, even if you don't love it, give it One a thing try. I've been telling, I've been telling. Oh, go on, One sorry. thing I've been telling my good drummer friends is. Let me tell you something, man. Being a good drummer that where the band is like not even thinking about you being there is not common. So if you're a fucking drummer that's a good drummer, make sure you're getting fucking paid. Because they'll be if they oh, we'll just get somebody else. Go ahead, asshole. And then you're gonna have to worry about all kinds of shit that you don't have to worry about with the guy that's just doing his job away, man. So you know, no, know that's, your that's worth the word of the day for me. Here, here, God. <laughs> Know your worth and earn your worth, you know. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna well of course, you gotta, you know, you, but that's what I mean. Like, you gotta, yeah. uh, to me, let me tell you something, man. To be a guy that's got to sing and play guitar and fucking people and all their eyes are on you, dude, when you got a drummer that's just making your life hell, god damn, dude, it's it sucks. Like, it sucks. And then when you got a drummer, and this is the best thing that a drummer, uh, dude, when you forget that that guy's even back there, that's the best because music is flowing so well that you're not even, it's like, that. He's just, it's just the song is just happening. And those are the fucking kind of drummers that are just so great to play with. And there's not a lot of them, man. Not a lot of them. Well, I gotta congratulate you for all the stuff you've been working on lately. It's you go from from gruesome to create a kill to kill division to the gin and tonics or you know these oh. uh, the name is escaping me, but the the uh, the eighties kind of the know, Depeche Mode thing, Depeche Mode metal oh, covers man. you did was outstanding. So <laughs> nice work. I, I appreciate it. No one no one gave a shit, but I tried. <laughs> I gave a shit. Damn it. <laughs> All right, um, let's take a quick break here, and we're going to go backwards again to what we were talking about, all the, all the Neil Peart and the, and the Rush and everything else. Uh, we played a video earlier in here. Um, I'm going to throw another one on right now, so if anybody's got to take a quick break, 
I don't want to keep you guys much past, you know, two hours. So I'm going to just, just, I'm not trying to shorten everybody like to be a dick, but if you guys only have a couple hours, I'm just going to get some of these videos in. And we'll, we'll move some of the next questions along and Excellent. I will see you guys in a few minutes. And by the way, Jason, I, I loved being here and filming this.
Damn. Permanent. I like it because of the little uh, the blast the, the beat. There was a the nice best touch. Part, the best part of that <laughs> solo is the two seconds where I start playing the rims of the concert toms. I don't know what the hell propelled me to do that, but that was so fucking cool. And you hear someone go, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, who the fuck was that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Probably Anton. <laughs> well, that's hilarious. That was awesome, dude. Oh, my God. My favorite part was the blast beat. <laughs> I know you love that. I just tried to sque- squeeze that in there for like two measures. <laughs> yep. Subtle. Very subtle. Subtle blasting. Yeah. It's a light dusting of, of a blast. Subtle, subtle yeah. blaster. Yeah. That's called let's get out before I before I mess this up. <laughs> so 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 Gus had an interesting thing happen to him a few years ago, and if I'm not mistaken, Jason, I just saw an announcement where you're gonna be touring um is it Indonesia or my or Jakarta or Oh yeah, I gotta get on a three day long trip next Tuesday. <laughs> so let's That's a long let's, trip. Let's yeah, use dude. that to uh Six let's use that to travel, talk a little bit about touring. Travel. Sorry, Ian, I'm talking over you. No, it's uh, fine. Just, say that again. <laughs> I said, let's just use that to start off uh, one of the topics I had in the list that we've ignored, which is awesome because this is yeah. fun. But uh, the ups and downs of touring and touring gear, and we can, we, we, you know, I want Gus to tell you that story real quick if you don't already know it, um, just as a heads up. And two, um, you know, you can talk about some of the gear um, benefits of your your touring. Make sure that your paperwork's in order. You're endorsing companies and whatnot, um, so each you know each of you can talk a little bit about ups and downs of touring. Maybe a funny story, maybe a bad story, maybe a good story, whatever. But Gus, why don't you start with the <laughs> that you know what I'm talking about? Um, well, you know what I'm I, I would about. Definitely, I know is, what he's talking about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is no bullshit. But when you go to places like that, you just have to make sure that all the paperwork is like set and legit. I haven't heard of any bands having issues since that happened to us, but uh, long story short, for those of you that don't know, uh, Malevolent Creation, in 2009, we were held hostage in Jakarta uh, by their actual immigration police because they are corrupt and they ended up extorting money from the promoter. And it's because there was literally this like 18 foot tall poster of the band that we all took pictures with because we were like, oh, fucking Metallica. And they actually thought we were actual Metallica, like that big of a band. <laughs> so they literally kidnapped us out of our hotel at gunpoint and uh, basically arrested us. And so they got money from us. And we were like, wait a minute, how big do you think we are? <laughs> we're like, dude, there was like 1,500 people with this gig tops. Like, <laughs> we're not Metallica, man. Don't let that poster fool you, buddy. You know, we don't have that kind of dough. So, you know, they got, they ended up getting like six grand or something like that from the promoter. And then they let us go the next day. So just make sure all your fucking paperwork's in order, man. Well, I mean, our tour manager's in charge of it. There's usually never an issue, but now I feel really comfortable going to Jakarta next week. Thanks. Yeah, he's stoked. He's stoked. (laughs) (laughs) Don't take pictures. (laughs) Don't take pictures of any posters of you, no matter the size. (laughs) <laughs> I don't, I don't right. fucking show in the first place um, i know someone some kid is watching in jakarta right now this talk, but yeah. sorry hey man yeah, i'll say this the fans are dude they they take metal it's a religion over there for real like the fans in jakarta were sick i mean the that's why so many like the politicians are metalheads it's crazy right but now when i went <laughs> yeah, right. That would, that would have never gotten no over the went. current the current leader's regime. Who he's very pro death metal, I believe. Yeah, so I hear. <laughs> so well, a good, it's a, it's a, a good... festival with us in Sepultura. So I'm really I'm nice. I'm really not thinking that you know. It's not no, dude. Every everybody that's gone over there since I mean that's 2009. That's what 14 years ago. Yeah. I'm sure it's totally cool now. You'll be fine. It's just, it's just, you know, the amount of that. It's like if we're doing Japan and Philippines and other territories, you know, okay, fine. But it's like, shit, get on a plane Tuesday, fly to Germany, land there, day off there, sit around a hotel, then get on the plane the next day, 
13 hours to Singapore, then another two hours to Jakarta, get in like at 10 o'clock in your hotel at 10 o'clock at night, and then you got to play the next day. And then guess what? And just get to just get started all over again Sunday morning at seven at the airport. <laughs> so you want to be a drummer, gotta, huh? Right. <laughs> you know what's interesting, and and it and it's and it'll be interesting to hear what you guys think of this. But I got to tell you, since the pandemic, like you know, I'm obviously older, and dude, I I kind of dig my bed. So like going on tour for me. You know, I used to be much more gung ho about it. I mean, I'm still very grateful to be able to tour, and and the situation yeah. that I'm playing with now, I'm just so enjoying playing the stuff I'm doing right now. Um, but man, the traveling is just beats shit out of me, man. It, it does, and it get, as you get older, it just get, it gets harder. Traveling is getting harder. Period. I mean, yeah, like the last absolutely. the last three or four flights I've taken anywhere have been delayed. Last time I got delayed three days. I stayed with Elliot Hoffman. Yeah, in, yeah, he told me. Wow. I mean, yeah, so I was stranded in New York City for three days. Like, thankfully, I had oh, to go with Elliot in you his know? wicked studio. That sucks. No, well, nothing was put together. We, in <laughs> fact, we, we were trying to we were trying to piece shit together when we were there just to play drums. <laughs> but yeah. Fun. Yeah, traveling's not what it used to be, you know. What about recently you got to fill in for the great Charlie Benante of uh Anthrax? Let's talk yeah. about that experience, Derek, because uh that had to be a lot of fun. What was that like when you got the call? How quickly did you run over to your kit with that set list and start going over it? Or was it like, oh, I got this, you know what I mean? Among the living, uh, you know. I'm curious. Um, I, you know, I, I still yes, don't know how, yes, it, Derek, how it came about. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I still don't know how it came experience. about. I don't, I don't think Jason's ever done anything like that before. Never done yeah, that. No. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, Jason knows this all too well, but I, I don't even know how. I, I talked to Charlie a few days ago. I was like, dude, I, you know, how did that even happen? You know, he's like, well, just the stars were aligned, I guess. You know, it's like. There's no conflict of interest. I'm not playing with anybody in any kind of capacity that would cause me not to be able to do a gig if they need to be last minute. So that was like a big factor, I think, you know. But Charlie had asked me like well before anybody knew about the Pantera stuff if I would be interested. And it's funny because like he he started calling me up like rather frequently. I mean, we were talk, you know, we would talk every once in a while anyway, but he started calling me up rather frequently about uh bass drum patterns and how do how do you how do you approach this and finally after about six weeks of this i'm like all right dude what gives what's going on so he told me that you know the whole thing with pantera uh, i was say ah okay that makes sense um and he would say hey speaking of that if i needed you for anthrax would you be into doing it i was like well yeah of course i mean charlie's a him and Dave, like during that time period in high school, I mean, and Lars, you know, like that. that's going back to what I said earlier about the whole movement of, of thrash metal. But Charlie was at the top of the list, man. I mean, you go back and listen to some of that stuff, like the end of horror of it all, horror of it all. That, I mean, that's like 228, 230 in 1987. It's, it's with, this is, this it's, is the one thing I got to interject on you. And it's ridiculous. We all, we all talk about Dave. Dave is the king. Charlie was cleaner and Charlie yep. was faster. And, and the Charlie sound was did, better. And Charlie wrote the songs. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and you got, you got, wrote, you got. he had he but had the cool more thing was <clears throat> he, he had the most dynamics out of all yeah. of the, all of those yeah. thrash guys. He had because he, he was a goddamn from, guitar player. Yeah, and he like came he out wrote, he wrote the songs. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was completely killer doing the gig. The guys are great. I mean, Jason knows like they completely made me feel at home, and it, it was like literally zero pressure at all, except for when they start throwing songs at you that you haven't ever played with them before. Fifteen minutes before a freaking show. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm like, dude, I'm glad you guys got. I'm glad you guys have confidence in me because. <laughs> like we, you know, I so say you realize we've yeah. never played the song before, even, right? Even I, like, even I got lost in the solo section of NFL. I'm like, well. Where are they going right now? <laughs> well, you know what was funny about that? Like we rehearsed that song, right? We did rehearse it in the back. Nobody told Joey that we weren't that what version we were doing. So he went on the live version. We're playing oh, the album God. version. 
but nobody told Joey, you know. So, dude, it, it's even worse. One night, we, one night we were up in Canada. It was it was my my last tour I did with those guys in 2012, and we were up in Canada, and something something happened during there was a snafu during sound check between Caggiano and Frank, and Frank left the stage during the sound check, so he he just took off. So he didn't know that that uh, be all end all was getting added that evening. So. <laughs> Uh, once we got to that point in the set, he thought it was, he thought it was got the time was next. So he goes into got the time and the band. Oh, wow. The band, the band doesn't do nothing. He turns out, looks at me like it's my problem. Like, you know, <laughs> well, you coming in. I go, I just motion towards the set list. And he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know what is amazing about playing with them though and it's something i noticed like on the very first night because like charlie had sent me i asked him i was like dude you know i said i know all this stuff and you know maybe some of the newer songs i need to brush up on or whatnot but like you know we all know these songs you know so that was an issue, but I was like, do you have anything that you could send me? And he was like, bro, we just got doing that XL thing, and there was like 27 songs that he sent me sans drums. Now, they don't play with clicks or any of that stuff, so when I'm playing to it, I'm having to, to follow him. So yep. it was a really it was a really good uh, learning strategy for me to try to really cop his feel, where Absolutely. he speeds up and where he slows down. And yep. There's there's certain things that he always does, you know, and I made sure to nail that stuff so the band didn't notice it. But what what I was going to say about them, they have the quickest recovery time of any band on stage in real time that I have ever seen in my life. Like if something does get I mean, dude, it's a bar or two, man. And like those guys are right back in it, you know. Yeah. Uh, Very, very, very cool, man. I mean, these guys have played together fuck, man, 40 years, you know, like. That kind of chemistry you have on stage with each other, you cannot get that, like most anywhere, you know. It's true. Very awesome. cool. Awesome. So thankful to be able to do it. You know, it was awesome. It's cool experience. Absolutely. And cool that a band like that you would think is playing to a click, but that's kind of a whole nother challenge. We get as as these guys who play in these kinds of bands that we play in nowadays. Uh, everybody's playing to a click. You know what I mean? So. To play some extreme metal and some fast, complicated stuff like that without a click is a testament to not only the tightness of that band, but your ability to blend right in with them and to 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 have that hey, natural. I was clock. thankful. I was thankful to have those tracks, you know, because I shredded that shit. I was recording myself, you know, over that replacing Charlie's drums with mine and sending them to the guys. <laughs> like, right. hey, is the feel cool? Like, if everything feel all right? Because that was the most important shit, you know. That's um, great. Just nailing that feel and making sure it felt like anthrax, you know? Yeah. Yep. yep. I mean, all, all the live videos I saw, and it kind of goes to my point that I was saying earlier, like, I bet you those guys, you know, Derek was, I, I and I'll be honest with you, I was totally impressed with Derek's level of detail uh, to the band, like I listen to it, and I'm just listening to Anthrax. I mean, some of the double bass you could tell is a bit cleaner now, <laughs> but other than that, like he just really blended in, and that's you know that band probably got done with that first sign. It was like, whew, cool man, we don't even dodge. We're we're good. Like you know, <laughs> the confidence it just gives them confidence, you know. Yeah, yeah, ball, busters, yeah, ball busters too you know they like to have fun and bust balls and you know it just it was a good experience they made it easy man that's that's what it's all about and the same to our friend over here we can't forget he did the same thing like 10 years before Derek. he's yeah, the fucking yeah. innovator he's the he knows <laughs> he knows <laughs> no same thing that's a testament oh. to both you guys man you know absolutely. and just i gotta t i gotta make a shout out to matt because like dude that King Diamond gig and, you know, obviously Mickey D's like parts over the years, but just your own adaptation and parts to things that you're doing in King Diamond is brilliant. I love it. It's it's amazing. And it's, it's so cool to see. And you've had you've been doing that for a good, good while, you know, and it's awesome to see. Yeah. Thank you, man. I don't know if my mic is working. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's still a light gig, but you're good. It worked for a few words. Really makes my night. 
Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, you know, is I see you playing multiple styles of gigs as well. I see you playing country gigs and all this stuff. You know what I mean? You're always posting about playing all these, all these, uh, these different show. You're not just, uh, you know, you're not a one trick pony. It's freaking awesome. Man. If the check goes through, I'll play for you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, advice for any drummer right there, man. That's it, dude. That's 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 one a of the best pro, dude. I can tell you. That's funny. <laughs> I mean, but you know what's but you know what's interesting? Like the sentence can be said that he plays in the band that Metallica like fanboys over. You know what I mean? Like that's fucking pretty sick. That is dope. Like man. he plays a gig at, and James Hetfield's like <laughs> that fucking Dude, rules, everybody. man. Everybody, it's you know, I mean, King Diamond is just such an iconic character. Just a you know a, 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 a you could argue you know what I mean in his own way as big as a kiss or as a you know what I mean an Alice Cooper it's amazing uh, uh, this this it's amazing. you know yeah this kind of transcendent figure so yeah. to be able to say that yeah I mean you play you play with him is incredible and those songs I mean Jesus Christ dude Jesus Christ. how how fun you know <laughs> gotta be fun yeah it's gotta be it's gotta be fun that's yeah. great I love that so cool it's a hoot <laughs> yeah that's great it's a hoot <laughs> hey gus is frozen yeah, yeah no, gus, uh... gus is having such a good time he's stiff with joy he's he's <laughs> transcended the matrix over here he's just fro frozen in a permanent smile like the joker for all it'd of be eternity. crazy if he was frozen like that but the fan was still moving like in twin peaks or something. <laughs> yeah <was> exactly yeah. <laughs> frozen in carbonite baby <laughs> well, while he's frozen, let's take a little look at uh, some of Matt's handiwork. Oh, yeah. All right. We'll be right back.
<laughs> exactly. Amazing. That's so killer. I love that. <laughs> so solid. Yeah, that's my favorite part. That added that. fill. Yeah. Yeah, that that, great. sounds familiar, that one, a little bit. I feel like... <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> That's so good. Love it. So let's talk a little bit about what you guys got coming up. I know uh, Jason just talked about the uh, the tour he's got going on. Uh, Matt, is, uh, is there any word of any other touring with uh, King Diamond anytime soon? Or I know you play, you know, every night pretty much <laughs> with somebody, but... What's yeah, going on with King the latest news I have with King is that uh, he's expecting to maybe go out fall of 2024. Okay, I got. <laughs> well, that's, ah. that's excellent news. I know yeah, somebody I was asking about yeah, that Indonesia is the or that Jakarta thing is just that one show. It's not a tour, sadly. But I've got that, and then Shadows Falls, the log, uh, Lamb of God boat at the end of October. Right. What's up with the new Shadows album? Got five songs done with drums and guitars and some bass. And we're writing the next five. We have three of those five written so far. Hopefully we'll be tracked nice. by the end, end of the year. That's that's the uh, that's the plan. We'll we'll see. Yes, it is. Perfect. What about you, Gus? Uh, Left to Die goes out in November for like three weeks on the West Coast. And um, and then working on the new Gruesome record, which is fucking kicking my ass. So that's going to be like a challenge. for. All right, Derek, we were talking earlier and you were talking about New Serpent's Rise. What's what's happening there? Oh yeah, I'm I'm rec I'm in recording limbo right now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I'm working on. Um, obviously, that band horror stuff is getting finished. That's like 144 songs over a hundred different musicians. Uh, wow! It's absolutely massive, massive project. And then related to that, the Doomzilla is coming out. I'm also doing Brian Kingsland's solo stuff. Uh, X Nile guitar player. Uh, I've got my own band, Isotropy, that we're we're doing a new EP right now, Serpent's Rise. I've just finished about close to 35 minutes worth of demoing new Serpent's Rise 6, six I guess. Um, so just busy there. i got snake season coming up right now, so it's I'm just kind of going to be here dealing with the animals and recording as much as I can. So. Serpent's Rising in more than one way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any chance you could uh, uh, turn around and play as a little piano? Yeah. I'm just more, you know, I'm so comfortable in the touring. I mean, in the uh, in the studio stuff, you know, it's like for me to. I mean, I like I love doing the shows with Anthrax. That was fun, but I, I mean, I don't really have a desire to get out there like full time like that, you know. Um, Can you play us a little bit? Just, what's that? Can you play us a little bit? A little bit of what? I don't know. One of the, something you're working on with serpents. I heard your uh, the drums earlier, and they sounded great. Let me see what I got up. We'll put you on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is actually some of Brian Kingsland stuff. Can you hear me? This is some of Brian Kingsland stuff. If you want to hear like just a second of it, um, let me see if I can get my computer to wake up. I meant you actually drumming. <laughs> oh God, no, dude. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, who the hell wants to play drums at eleven o'clock at night? <laughs> I mean, I do, I I do, but it's just that the problem is, is I haven't been. If I would have been playing, you know, all day or whatever, you know. well, maybe we'll do something like that in in the future. I can always, you know, but like, did you hear any of this? Yeah, yeah. This is this is stuff from Brian. <laughs> All right. Sounded heavy. I can't hear it because I'm not listening to my own playback. It sounds sick. It sounds like that. Yeah, you know. 
<laughs> death metal. <laughs> uh, right on. Does you know something that did something that did happen to me this year that's kind of cool and like not a, not a lot of people know, but I was in a band. I kind of got my professional start years ago, like touring and whatnot, in a punk rock band named Bedlam Hour, right? And it's it's it ranges from like happy pop punk to like aggro and gnostic front kind of hardcoreish, you know, and kind of everything in between, right? And the last show we did together was about 27 years ago. And I happened to run in, into Chuck, the main songwriter, guitar player, singer, back home in South Carolina. He said, oh, man, me, you know, me and my wife, Sherry, we retired. We're living at, here in Polly's Island now. And I was like, oh, my gosh. She goes, yeah, uh, my wife told me I'm about to drive her crazy because we're retired and I need to get the boys back together, get the band going again. <laughs> and I said, well, dude, that's a good idea. You know, what, has it been how long? 25 years? So he's like, 27, actually. So we decided, and Chuck is like really proficient, like at getting stuff done. I swear to God, within two months, we had a five song EP finished, recorded, and a couple of shows booked. Uh, and we, we did a couple of shows. We did a warm up show in Myrtle Beach, and I thought there was going to be like 20 people there because nobody goes to shows there. There ended up being like 170 kids show up at this all ages show in Myrtle Beach. And then we went to Columbia, South Carolina, and did a show the next day, just kind of where we always played. And about 350 people showed up to, to come see it. And it's the first gig we have done in 27 years. It was like, <laughs> it was, dude, I mean, it's like we never even stopped playing. Everybody pulled their guitars out from under their beds, kind of shit, because everybody had careers and. But nobody had really, like, really kept up with playing so much, you know, except for Chuck, really, and, and me. But, well, yeah, so cool. We uh we went to New York and did a show up there. That's how I got stuck and ended up staying with Elliot. But, uh, yeah, awesome. it's just kind of cool. It's it's really cool to kind of reconnect with, with that kind of vibe, you know. And, again, intent, you know, getting together with our friends and just playing some music that made us happy. And, you know, it's punk rock. I mean, whatever, you know, so cool. Awesome. Well, I know it's yeah. uh, coming up on a couple hours, but uh, there's a there's a question here. If you guys don't mind, um, see if anybody else has a couple questions here, and then we could wrap it up. Um, this one here is for Jason. Do you guys have a name for the unnamed band you're with uh, in with Phil Demel, uh, Michael Lando, John Bush, and Jack Gibson yet? Did you see how I ho I totally skirted that even that that topic once I was telling you about what I had going on for the rest of this year. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody caught you. <laughs> yes, there is a band name and uh, that will be revealed next year. Once the band is unveiled the proper way. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't give you more on that, but there is definitely a band name. That's cool. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you when I see you in October. <laughs> Here's one for yeah. Gus. Uh, about Gruesome, Left to Die, anything uh, European next year? Or I think he's asking both and or. Oh, man. Uh, Gruesome is doing, so, uh, I think, three weeks with uh, Sabbath. Um, I'm hoping to have a new album out by then. That's in June. Uh, Left to Die is doing a run in August with uh, Party Sand, Brutal Assault, um, some other festivals, like a festival run. Uh, supposedly some Jap some Japan and Australia stuff. So next year, both bands will be in Europe. I think gruesome even twice to Europe. Nice. Cool. What about you, Rainy? What do you got going on? Uh, I'm going in the studio with Scarlet Rose at the end of the month. Got about three new songs to record, so uh, I'm pretty excited. One of them is definitely on the heavier side. Uh, Scarlet Rose is kind of a glam-influenced project that I've been playing lately, but uh, it's got some fun heaviness to it and some fun parts. And um, yeah, yeah, we've been uh, in the studio arranging, doing the whole Lars. Air metal rules. Here, here's the song. Oh, thank you so much, man. Yeah, guys, check it out, Scarlet. We have we have one song out right now yeah. called uh, "Rise from the Ashes," and um, yeah, man, it's a total total kind of glammy throwback, but it's got some good drums, and I really am super happy with the way that the drums came out, especially on that song. Uh, almost above many things I've recorded, just because it felt so natural. Um, so much stuff that I've recorded lately has been 
like you said, so sound replaced and so kind of perfected that it's like, oh man, this has the right element of realness, of rawness. It sounds like some stuff that was recorded in the 80s when they didn't do the amount of clipping that they that they do nowadays. You know what I mean? So um, well, yeah, yeah, you couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you had to just get in there and perform, and um, that's that's what we did. And and it, I'm I'm really happy with how natural it sounds because it's so easy to get locked in that thing of well, you want everything to sound perfect. And it's like wait, it's okay if there's some mistakes. It's okay if yep. not everything sounds perfect. It's yep. music. It's a living, breathing thing, and it pu pushes and it pulls and it do does all this stuff and. And it can still be great, you know? Now, obviously, <laughs> you, you can do all of those things <laughs> beyond the point where it's great. But if there's just a little bit there, I, I I was really happy with the amount of character that it had. You know what I mean? Kind of accepting of those kind of things and and um and and happy to kind of almost highlight them in a way and just be like, yeah, this is this is real fucking rock and roll. So um nice. the, the next songs are gonna I be like a lot to see of fun, more of that. But, like to yeah, see man. more of that for sure. You yeah. ever know? You ever you ever correlated this? And Gus and I were talking about this the other day. But you ever correlated the fact that like since technology has made it everything so much easier for recording and just easier to create music, and the correlation with music not being worth anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like so. <laughs> Fuck that. Yeah. Technically, we got better, you know, like it became like really easy, but now it's not worth anything because it got to the point that, that it's all the streaming I mean? like, services. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and then, yeah, you yeah. can do it in your living room now. So it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Everybody's a producer. That's like, uh, Gus and I talk about this a lot too. It's like, because we had an opportunity to go to More Sound together when I was recording uh, In Cold Blood for Malevolent Creation. And like that whole atmosphere. I would like, that I, shit. That, that kind of atmosphere is like completely gone nowadays, you know? Like yep. it's pretty funny. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's here and there. There are studios um, like that, you know, that operate and do that kind of work, but it, it's few and far between, you know? It, so yeah, cool they're to... getting fewer. Yeah. That yeah. that was the beauty about recording that was it was an old wood panely fucking studio, you know what I mean? It was like, Tape oh, machine. yeah. This, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? I mean we didn't we didn't use a tape machine, but I, they had I mean, one I, there. I, but it was like <laughs> it felt kind of like it wasn't Abbey Road, but it felt it had that vibe where I was like, oh yeah, right, Sunset yeah. Sound, those kind of places, those iconic rooms where it's like, yeah, no, now everybody has state of the art, everything is it's like more sound was the same way. so yeah. sterile, you know what I mean? And this is like, yeah, this is kind of dingy. Somebody smoked some cigarettes in here, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's funny. Yeah, but the thing about back then, that's that's the that what like the drums needed to sound good, and you needed to play them well, or else your record was going to sound like shit. And you know, you can okay boomer me till you're blue in the face, but I'm sorry, man. There's an integrity there uh, to the performance, and and that's just something that I just think, you know, when a computer sucks all the life out of everything, like dude, you can show up with like shitty drums. And play them not super tight, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, it was, um, yeah and it really should. And, and yeah, yeah. Different. Word, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, before and we most wrap people, up. most most people would know <laughs> that you know a lot of those old school records back then more sound like when we did that record, uh, the kicks were mic'd. Right. So like you tracked with a mic'd bass drum and then you went back, you had to spend almost a half a day resampling each kick for every song back to the tape machine. You know, so it, it wasn't like there was a lot of hoops you had to jump through to be able to get this type and, of modern day sound. And not only here, that, you know. that album, if I remember correctly, most of those songs were one take. Like I only remember one or two puns the whole situation. I think there was like two or three songs we redid, but yeah, I think most all of those were single take. Just and if you remember, Scott had like ran tape and didn't tell us. We he told us to kind of warm up, and he ran tape on us till the like people don't realize this either. Those tapes back that back in the day, you could only fit about sixteen to twenty minutes of music on them. So and you and you had to take them off and put a whole new set of tapes on. 
but he he stopped us after about 20 minutes i remember and, and saying like hey guys come in here and listen to this and i think we had we had nailed like four songs or something like and they didn't even tell us and i was like see that's another thing about a really killer engineer like engineers know like this has kind of been lost too because he's looking for the performance and he realized right then and there i need to roll tape because these guys right now are on fire and this may not happen tomorrow you know what i mean and like we ended up recording those drums for that record in what two and a half hours three hours that night something like that i mean like that. and it just you got through that quick. whole album pretty fucking quick yeah, I mean, it just. I mean, I, you know, Scott's face when when Derek started playing drums, Scott Scott was behind the console, and, and you know, and, and this is Scott Burns' late era. Scott Burns. This is when he. This was his last album, and he was, was super burnt album. out, and he was like dogging almost. I mean, he was you know Scott was was you know pretty spicy with the whole situation back then. He was burnt out. And then Derek starts playing, and he, you can see, like, relief on his face because he's like, oh, this is going to be fucking easy. <laughs> Press record. Done. <laughs> he, he, was, he was pretty fucking blown. You know, I mean, to see Derek Roddy circa 1996 was some shit, man. <laughs> I mean, it was some shit. <laughs> uh, that, was uh, that was a fun record. Fun times. I was cool. I got to record with him, man. Like, I never would have. That was something Scott else. Like, Burns, man. I was like, I, yeah, that's that's wild. There's something I don't really think about a lot nowadays, just because he retired, and you know, that's cool that that book is coming out. He's got this whole book. He went out with a bang. Sound stuff. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. went out with a blast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, he did. <laughs> Fun. Fun stuff. Does any any of you have any other questions for any other of you? Hey, uh, Jason. Did you ever the uh, do you do you know the Crumb Suckers guys? Uh, aside from only Gary, he's you know from Propane. He's the only one. Why? I love the. Oh. Yeah. I know right. uh, Gary Mesco from just you know from him being in Propane. Jason, I'm crushing your head. Squishing the heads, baby. <laughs> Don't panic. <laughs> That's all I got. Well, thank you guys, man. Let's wrap it up. Thanks for having us, man. It's been so much Thanks, fun. Dude, this is a blast. Thank yeah, you. It's the ringleader. Organization, Ian. I'll I'll try and get better with it. it was, I was staring at so many different things. That, you know, I feel like maybe I didn't talk enough or something. But um, I think I think we did pretty good. Did you know what I mean? Well. We we have six motherfuckers in here. Yeah. So <laughs> the fact that we weren't all just <laughs> blabbering over each other the whole time, I'd say we did pretty damn good. We got to get ourselves. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, right? the, well, it's it's eleven p.m. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it went very. Oh, have well. fun! Hey, Thank, thanks everybody who listened. Oh, dude! Yes, thank you. You know, That's and I will say it. this, man: we got we got to do this at a NAM soon. Yeah, That's we didn't even talk about that, but I'll be there. <laughs> have fun! Oh, yeah, baby. Yeah. Well, right. this has been awesome. Um, thank you again to everybody who uh, showed up and, and made comments and and joined us and thank you for taking time out of your day uh, for your, um, <clears throat> excuse me taking time out of your days to join us here all of you uh it's been nice to, I've, I've talked to some of you recently but not as often as we should um so i'm trying to keep in touch a little more it's been great to see all your faces and um much respect Amen. to all of you for everything you've done in music thank you thank you ian you're welcome thank you all it's been a learning experience. We've all learned things about each other we didn't know know before. You know what I mean? It's been for a really real. beautiful thing. Yeah, thanks for putting it together, Ian. You know, You're guys, welcome. everybody yeah, out man. there who's watching this right now, if you don't already follow the channel, like, subscribe, smash that notification button. <laughs> That's what all the YouTubers like are, are, are saying no, nowadays. Well, uh, um, but yeah, great, great content. More great content from Sick Drummer. Let's go, y'all. Much love. Everybody have a great night. I will talk to you all very soon, and this is how I end it. Don't you dare. Later, guys. <laughs>